This is Thursday, October 1st, 2015. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Maureen Sullivan. Our cameraman is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus, and we are privileged to have with us today Ken Barber. Welcome, Ken. Welcome to you. Now, uh, Ken Barber is a World War II veteran, but we're going to be kind of going down memory lane to Natick before the war. But before we start, may I ask where you were born? I was born at the end of Bacon Street before Route 9, up on the hill. And that's in Natick? Natick. Okay. Where the railroad track crossed. Wow. And when were you born? I was born on February 10th, 1924. And what town do you currently live in? Natick. Your marital status? My wife died in 2002. Do you have children? Two children, Kenny and Donna. Do you have grandchildren? Yes, four. Great-grandchildren? Yeah, four great-grandchildren. All right. Now, Ken, where in Natick did you grow up? I grew up in the Harvard Street section, Sarn Street North. Avenue. Then moved when I was in the seventh grade. I was moved to West Natick on 215 West Sunday. No, I think that's a flower show. Anyways, West Sunday. And tell us, first of all, what life at the end of Harvard and Solon Street was like. It was great. Mm -hmm. Growing up, we grew, we knew there was a lot of boys in the neighborhood. And it was, as soon as we get home from school, we were out playing baseball or football depending on season. And where did you play hard, uh, baseball and football? On Harvard Street, corner and middle, and Harvard. The field started at the front of the Mary Gilson School to the top of the middle street. That was all field. It's all houses now. Mm -hmm. Now, Ken Barber is, of course, associated with Barber Brothers Flores, a longtime Natick business. And you got started uh, in the business at an early age. Well, when I was a kid, I, I was making more money selling flowers than a lot of men were making at that time. But I gave it all to my family growing up. This was depression years. And uh, I grew flowers on West Central Street. I grew them on the back field. We had a field that ran from our house to the Natick Ice Company, which is now an office park. But I, as a kid, and when I was in high school, I ran the Natick Ice Company from 3 to 11 by myself, making ice, t tons of it. And in the summertime, I would work the 11 to 7 shift by myself, 
I was at the time I was 14, and I'd stay there all night. The police would pick me up at, noon, at 12 o'clock at night and take me down to McKinney's Diner on Bourne Street. <laughs> and we'd have steak and eggs and coffee, and when we were through, we'd, they'd take us back. But the plant was only run by me, and I stayed there all night. But the police checked in during the night. That was the old days. You were mentioning before the interview Chief Evans, who was, was the, the, who led the He was the chief, and, and he was Chief Evans. Mm -hmm. I ended up his grandchildren and great grandchildren. I knew, but the, his daughter lived across the street from me on Kinsman place for years. Now her nephew owns the house, Bobby Evans, whose father was worked for the town too. Was a policeman. Now before the interview you were mentioning that uh, when kids were in downtown Natick Chief Evans would often kind of call him over. He always, always checked, see who you were. He knew mostly everyone in the town. Back in those days, it was nine thousand people. That's all. Mm -hmm. And you'd say you were a babbit. He knew where you lived. Get home. What are, you, what are you down here for? Mm -hmm. But he always checked on the kids. Mm -hmm. If they didn't belong downtown, he sent them home. Now, Ken, you had a job when you were six or seven years old, and you that were mentioning was that. Bill Brannigan, mm -hmm. who the Brannigan family actually brought part of my father's life, that he was left an orphan, or he was adopted by someone, mm -hmm. but left in South Natick, and all the Irish family brought him up. But he was in South Natick, mm -hmm. and he started selling insurance when he 17 or 18 for John Hancock. And he was their top salesman by the time we grew up. And this is but Mr. During the Depression, uh -huh. he was working for John Hancock. Was this Mr. Brannigan or your father? My father. Okay. And he has a debit and framing that included all the Italian section on Wavery Street way up. Let's get back to Mr. Brannigan. I understand he was a cobbler on Washington Street, and you got your first job through him. That clean. We dusted the, I did, actually all my, brothers worked there as we grew up. <laughs> but he he took up the, he had a lot to do with my father growing up in South Natick, the Brannigan family. There were three or four Irish families that took care of him. He, uh, I lost my track. That's okay. 
Well, you were um, like six or seven years old. You were working oh, for. I, yeah, yeah. I, mm -hmm. I was when I was eight years old. I think I, was, mm -hmm. I rode my bike to Marion Street, and an old man by Mr. Jordan, his daughter worked for the town at that time. I, I thought of her name the other day, but she worked for the town, mm -hmm. Natick in the office. But uh, he asked me if I wanted to sell flowers. I was helping him. I'd ride the horse and keep him in the horse in the troughs as the plow. He lived in the last house on the left at that time on Bacon Street. There's a stone wall mm -hmm. in front of it. And he owned the land from there up to the Bacon Street. Kept his horse in the barn at the foot of the hill. There used to be cows and and buying there growing up. The house is still there, but the barn is go gone. And we, anyways, we grow flowers in the garden, all a mixture, all kinds of summer flowers, and we'd bunch them. He showed me how to bunch, put them together, but they looked, looked nice on us. Oh, like an old fat bouquet all, all put together. And I'd go out and Natick and frame him to start. He wanted 15 cents, and I got a qu quarter. But I, I boosted the price <laughs> to 30 cents after I sold them so quick. <laughs> I, I boosted the price to 30, and I was getting uh, as much as he was. <laughs> so, so I, I sold every day. I had, I went as far as Watertown, did Wellesley, and I, as I got older, we moved to West Natick. On, I grew the flowers out back of the house. We had all the land in the back by the tracks. And my brother and I, in later years, bought all those houses and ripped them all down. So we had, at one time, before Malkiuri started in the picture, but we were talking with Roach Brothers to put the place there on West Central. Well, the, we talked with both brothers. We talked with Piggly Wiggly. <laughs> and there was an, all the people that own the, now the market basket. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where they were in Worcester, mm -hmm. but we had three who were talking to. But it ended up, we just decided to build a bigger place on West mm -hmm. Central. Mm -hmm. The original pits, I should have brought that picture in. Mm -hmm. I have the original picture in the day we opened. Wow. We opened up. 
February, I mean, December 7th, 1947. We got out of the service at 46th, and we worked for Butterworth Flowers in Framingham, who was the lad forest in the area. It's a Catholic church on Concord Street is on the land that Butterworth was on. And he had five big green up there growing orchids. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was our first job after the service. Speaking of greenhouses, you mentioned before the interview the greenhouse that used to be on um, Bacon Street. That was in our family, mm -hmm. distant relatives, mm -hmm. Montgomery's and the uh, Lamonts. Mm -hmm. They come from Scotland. They had the largest greenhouse in the world. It was 800 feet long on Bacon Street. They had about eight or ten of them. And there was underground tunnels. That's where we got the kick signs <laughs> out of the tunnel. And we brought them home and put them together. They were all packed. They just, but that's how we got it. And unfortunately, yeah. uh, the greenhouse is no longer there. That is the site no. of Kingdom Hall for Jehovah's Witnesses. They were all gone. But mm. All my great uncles and my great aunts, I had an aunt that was in the forest but in his business. And my great uncles all worked for one, worked for a forest in the Western part of the state, mm -hmm. Montgomery. They're still in business today. But my uncle Ed, who was the youngest, he helped put up a greenhouse on our original flower shop. We had a 50 foot greenhouse for show. And he helped us put the, and my grandfather put the benches up for us. But that was way back. Let's talk about uh, some of the other businesses in Natick that still existed when you were growing up. For example, the Colonial Theater. Yeah, the Colonial Theater was, that's when I worked for. Bill Granigan, mm -hmm. I got 50 cents. Mm -hmm. And that got me in the movies and a candy bar. Did you uh, like any movie or uh, any kind of movie? Well, back then, the movies, you would see a serial, serial before, Tom Mix mm -hmm. and all those, the cartoons. Uh, who was the other one? He had a wife. Uh, uh, Roy Rogers? No. 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 Uh, Roy Rogers made movies, though. He was good. Uh, Uh, did you prefer westerns and dramas and stuff oh, like that? Oh, Tom Mix. Yeah. Tom Mix and those were great. Uh huh. They had serials that they do a stop the picture. The guy's falling off a cliff to saw a shot, mm -hmm. and you wouldn't know it till the next week of. Uh, kept you going yep. for the cereals. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, do you remember places like uh, the Howard Baseball Factory? Oh, Mr. Howard became a great customer of Faber Brothers. And he had a daughter and a son. I guess they're both still living. But he's, we used to get baseball. There was, they call them rejects for 50 cents. Which get them with the ball. But he made a lot of softballs in Natick too. Mm -hmm. But he made, I guess he made the first baseball. The Howard Fact. Mm -hmm. And what, uh, let's go back a little Louis bit. Louis Whipple oh, was sorry. on Ash Street, too. Oh, the Whipples, yes. And he, he was in my church, the congregation. And when Natick went dry, Louis Whipple was the one that closed all the back. Five rooms in Natick. He got the churches together. I think we had some, like 30 bar rooms in Natick at the time. In fact, right around here, there were about seven of them. Wow. On this street, between the <laughs> court street. And I can remember as a kid, the bar, bar rooms. Mm -hmm. And they had a pool room, which my mother and father let us know that we don't go to pool rooms, and we, we never did. Believe me, we, <laughs> my father was six foot three and about 250. Uh, he was in a position to enforce his wishes, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> he had five boys. He told the back. <laughs> we had three girls. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go back to Harvard Street briefly. When you were um, living in that area, you told me you attended the Mary Gilson School. Yes. What was that like? Well, I remember that we had, there was one teacher for first and second, and for third and fourth, there was another teacher. But they used to have roaming, every place in Natick had a school, South Natick, West Natick, North Natick. But every section had a school to go to. And from, we went the first four at Mary Gilson on Harvard Street, which is ripped down. And then for the fifth and sixth, we went to Bacon School. We, no buses, you walked, snow. <laughs> we used to cut across, back then Walnut Hill, you go up, of course there was a walk up Sorrow Street, but we'd cut across the field at Walnut Hill. It was all field. The original building were there, but it was wide open when you get to the top of, uh, what's the street? Belvedere? Uh, that little road, Belvedere? What's, what you say? If you're saying, if you're going down the hill, uh, Walnut Hill, and you cross that street. Uh, wow, well, at the top, I was trying to think of the street. Oh. Oh. That's the Walnut Hill. Oh, Highland Street. Highland? Huh? Is, that, is that the street? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then, uh, what we do, uh, good weather, we'd kind of cross. Mm -hmm. Crossed down 
over the hills of Bacon Street, then go up to the sc school. I have to ask this because I went to Bacon School for a year and I lived in that neighborhood. Did, Did you play in the fire escape? <laughs> no, that was new. Ah. That was new uh -huh. after I, I got out. <laughs> you mean up the, 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 the tube on the yeah. side? Yeah. No, that was new. Okay. And we had Miss Lawson up uh -huh. in that top. And it was the one on the bottom. Miss Brown comes to me. I don't know whether it was Brown. Miss Lawson was a big, tough woman, I remember. Her. But I met my first girlfriend then. Mm -hmm. As I've met her back those days. <laughs> you meet you meet them in the theater. <laughs> Good place as any. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it was just a school crush, you know. Yeah. And I was Jean Goodall. She was up in north, way up in north, by the Dairy Queen. Wow. But she went to Bacon. That's where fifth and sixth mm -hmm. grades, because Murphy, they had f four grades. Yeah, they Murphy had two. School, yeah. My kids went to Mur Murphy. And, and you went to Natick High School when it was right here across the street. Yeah. Were you, uh, had you moved to West Central Street by that uh, time? We had double sessions that uh, uh, sophomore uh -huh. Yeah, We went from 12 to 5. In fact, during the 38 hurricane, we were in school. Ooh. And they couldn't go up West Central. It was all the trees were down. So we went up middle Sex Ave to Washington Ave, then out to West Central. We usually went up Pond Street, but we went up West Central. We got by the lake. The water was like waves going across the road. But uh, so we lived right up. West Central, mm -hmm. where home at, right there, where the glass tire points. That was. Now, Ken, when you were attending Natick High School, were you being transported by bus? Or were you riding a bus. bike? Your bus, okay. Stopped at a Simonetta's store, and my brother told me during the war they had to walk up. To Kendall Lane, I couldn't figure out why they changed the bus stop. He <laughs> said he was still going to high school though, during the war. And I was gonna—that was my next question. When, while you were attending Natick High School, were you made aware of events happening in Europe and Asia at that time? Of, were aware of what? Uh, were you made aware of events happening in Europe, in Asia? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Very much so. Mm -hmm. Very much so. We took it up in history, which I don't think they get much of t today. <laughs> Kids don't know much about anything when you ask. Now, Ken, and do you remember what you were doing the day Pearl Harbor was attacked? Yes. We were all sitting listening to the radio in the living room. Heard the president come on. Because uh, I never thought I'd go into the war. But uh, 
my two brothers signed up early, my two older brothers. I was the third one. And did you graduate from Natick High School? Yeah, 41. All right. So you were already out of high school? No. No? Uh, no, I was, that was my year. Yeah. I tell you, well, you were out in June I was 41. In, I was a senior. Yeah. Okay. I was most of my senior year, 16 years old. Mm -hmm. I turned 17 in February of my senior year. Okay. I was... Myself and John, John Grady were the youngest ones in our class. They took tests back though, those days. Mm -hmm. And my mother was glad to <laughs> get rid of me, put me in school. <laughs> but they give a test. Of course, my, I had three older, my sister Jean, who by the way, is still living. Oh, She's what? 96. Mm -hmm. And where is she living? Iowa. Her husband was Terry Townsend, who managed the A and P in Natick on Main Street for a long time. Okay, we have just entered the war years, and what I have in my hand are your brothers as part of a legacy of service. And which one was your oldest brother? My oldest is Henry. Henry, okay. So he was in business with me. All right, so if you'll hold that up for a second and tell us a little bit about Henry and what he did Henry. during the war. Well, he... He was flying. Uh-huh. He was he flew over the hump in Burma, India. I don't know what the hump was a big mouth right. And they were on a, a plane that carried supplies. So that's why they're flying over the hump. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they didn't make it over the hump, but mm -hmm. they each made out of our feet. Okay. <laughs> but I had a cousin, Tracy Hayes, mm -hmm. who lives in the, me. who graduated the same time I did. Mm -hmm. And he went down flying over the hump. And he was lost for about six months in the jungle. There was th three of them, not together though. Uh -huh. They were all by themselves. But he got out, but in what he did, the nerve, he just wasn't himself. He was mm -hmm. very nervous. Well, so he died, mm -hmm. died young. Mm -hmm. And what was the name of your cousin again? The one who was lost in the jungle? Tracy A. Hazen. H A Z E N. That was my aunt's son. Mm -hmm. And who was uh, next in line? Richard? No, Bill. Bill. Okay, let's find Bill. Bill. Now, Bill is quite a bit to his story. Okay. Robert? Yeah. Okay, well, okay, tell us a bit about Robert. Uh, well, it's Robert William. Mm -hmm. if I, we, we all called him Bill. And 
Bill went into the war in the Air Corps. He took all his training, but he's assigned to mm -hmm. B-29. Mm -hmm. I'll take that, thank you. Oh. Okay, and he was on B-29s, yep. And they took a lot of training, the B-29s, because that actually what helped us come home. Mm -hmm. And was he in Europe or United States? No, Pacific. He was another Pacific. Yeah. He was on Guam. Uh -huh. was, they didn't go to Guam right away. We didn't have Guam. But when they kept Guam, they made a field so they could go fly to Japan. And it's quite a distance uh -huh. from Guam to Japan. I, just, uh, I don't remember uh -huh. the miles. Okay. And who is next on the list? Uh, I want to tell you, well. Richard? No. Or Donald? <laughs> Richard. Okay, we'll grab Richard here. Rich, Richard. Uh, has a different story. Mm -hmm. He took all his basics and he was going to the occupancy of Japan. Mm -hmm. But on the way over, he slipped on the deck going down stairs somewhere and he hurt his back. So he went to the hospital and Japan and stayed there a while and then shipped them all. So it's it it kind of rough, rough time. Of it. Well, it could have been worse. Yeah. Okay. And how about Donald? Donald, I could see him. Of uh, okay, you can turn him around. <laughs> yeah, Arkansas, mm -hmm. Germany. He's the baby of the family. He's a e one now. He, he's exactly about ten years mm -hmm. younger than me. So that's how I know. Okay. And last but not least, you. Yeah. Well. There you go. <clears throat> and there's you, the middle child. <laughs> yeah. Well, I had, I had quite a career, but uh, I never got in the halfway. Mm -hmm. But we started out to the, went to Fort Devon. Took, and from Fort Devens, we took a train. We didn't know where we were going, but we ended up on Cape Cod at Edwards, and we still don't know what we're going to do. Thank you. Anyway, got to Edwards. We took basic training. At Camp Edwards. And then we shipped out to Osterville on the golf course. Our company mm -hmm. was on the golf course in Osterville. Right downtown, there's a road that goes down to the harbor, but the golf course crosses there. And we were up, I don't know what. Hole it was, but it was a, a nice green with setting the tent on. Okay. We had big tents. We were taking our basic training down there. Now, I was listed as a crane operator. So mm -hmm. Crane when, operator, on, huh? <laughs> on paper. But. but I worked at the Natick 
ice company. The crane was full of these ropes and pulled the ice up out of the freezer and, and taking them down and dumping them. But before he got the ice, he had to suck, suck the middle water out and then fill it. Uh -huh. I don't know whether you ever been in a nice house. Never had the pleasure, that, but... <laughs> but it's, I made tons of ice. <laughs> and they, once you dumped it, uh, there was 10 baths, 300 pound baths, and they went down then into the storage room. And when they got to the storage room, I had to go in and stand each bar up with torn, then slide them out of the way. Then the next day, someone would take them. They stacked them as high as that office building is. That stack ice. And that's what uh, made you a crane operator. That's okay. The, the, but. When I get down, they told me to go down the harbor, which was at the foot of the hill, and see the crane off. I get down there, there's this big crane. <laughs> I said, oh, jeez. I said, that's not what I run. He said, they're all the same. You pull them up. So, there's this big guy, he's in the crane. And I was, you know, not much weight on me. I swim and, but anyways, I get up in the crane. All I did, they attached this big pontoon on the crane, the crane. They're making a floating dock so I pulled the thing up and he said, just pull it. And it started swinging. Uh -oh. And the guys on the ground said, get that crazy guy. Yeah. They said, it's not too nice to work. Uh -huh. So that was the end of my crane offering. So I went back and told the First said, that's not the type of crane I run. So he says, what do you want to do? I said, well, you send guys to boat school. I said, I would like to be a boat operator. So we went to Katuit from Austinville. And then we took the Coast Guard taught us, of course, I couldn't even s swim. Uh-huh. <laughs> that didn't make any difference. Anyways, I, I learned how to do landing crafts. We invaded the vineyard where there was no people. Oh, yeah. I'm just kind of curious. Uh, what year was this, and what time of year? It was in the summer, thank you. It was. Yeah, uh, and the, and the what year was that? Forty three, forty two. What's that? What? Oh, what year? Were you doing basic on the oh, Cape? Forty three. Nineteen forty three. Okay, thank you. So you're spending the summer of 43 on the Cape, doing basic. Yeah. Well, you went from, well, we stayed in the tent in Austerville. We got A-class passes so I could go home every weekend. I, one or two of the guys had one fall from wool, 
woven trophy, the root nine and thumb, and everyone picked up back those days if you were sold to the pick it right up. And of course, Route 9's nothing like what it is today. No, no. far from it. Yeah. And uh, every, every street that came out had a crossing on Route 9. You, Bacon Street used to cross, go under the bridge. Every, every point had a, of course, Park Ave still has a outlet on a, but you can't cross. Well, let's get you back on the Cape, summer of 43. What yeah. happens after basic? Well, after Katuit, we went to Parpanessa Beach. And they had fences on the beach. And of course, back those days, uh, nothing but girls on the beach anyway. <laughs> the other guy had gone. And so we had machine gun training. And planes used to come over with a sleeve behind it. And we'd have one guy on your back to stop you from fire and be, can't hear anything. they bang on the show. But we'd fire up at the sleeve. And they, that's what we did is for machine gun. So we're in pup tents, you know those little tents. There, we stayed, stayed there for f five days, I guess, four or five days on machine gun training. Never had to use one. <laughs> but anyway, I knew how to do it. And, and from there, we went to Falmouth. And there's an island off of Fel, Fel, uh, 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 Washburn. Okay. Washburn and Ireland. Now it's all homes, fancy homes. But we had the whole island, and we did exercise. We're getting ready to ship out. So from there, we went to, we had our winter clothes and summer clothes. Mm -hmm. So we didn't know where we were going, Europe or the Pacific. So anyways, we went to New Orleans. And we were there for, for, we left in February of 44. Now your trip to New Orleans, uh, was that the first time you were outside New England? Yeah. So here yeah. you are, a young man in the city of New Orleans. Did you have, at least have a good time? <laughs> Well, let me tell you, I never had a drink until oh. I got to New Gu Guinea. Okay. And it was off for still. <laughs> so you, you didn't have a... I never had a drink. Okay. I can't say that my two brothers drank beer, but I, I never had one. But I did... In New Orleans, they were drinking beer, but I never had one, so I didn't drink it. I had plenty of shrimp, though. They used to put it 
on the bus. And how long were you in New Orleans? We were in the port of Amber Okay. right on the Mississippi River. And uh, I had KP, everyone had KP. I never seen so many cockroaches in my whole life. <laughs> and we used to have to spray every day. Oh. And they'd be running all over the floor. But it was a dark, it was a dark. That's what it was. And anyways, we shipped out. And we still had our winter coats. And, and as we got out in the mouth of the bay, it was destroyers picked up us. Oh, we were on the USS Swarney. Swarney. It was a, a luxury ship before the war. It was old. It was as old as you could. But I, we were on that boat. And we went through the Panama Canal. So we knew then we were going mm -hmm. Pacific. Mm -hmm. So we got through the Panama and we stopped at Bora Bora, which I always wanted to go back to. I never did. But oh. my wife and I did have a trip all planned to go to Australia. And I was going to take a side trip to Boone and New Guinea, which when I went there, the Jap landing boats, such as they were, nothing like ours, but they were all sunk in the beaches. But in Buna, that was a big battle. There wasn't many. In the Pacific, McCarthy used to hit places where there'd be no one, so they could go right on the beach. Mm -hmm. Now, how long did it take your vessel to go from the Panama Canal to Bora Bora? 30, 30 days to Melny Bay. And uh, were, uh, you were no part Jenny. of a convoy? Well, the no? cruisers left us. Uh-huh. They escorted us to the Panama. And then Pacific, you're pretty much on your own. Uh, we were, I don't know, there could have been crew, uh, submarines, mm -hmm. something following us. But as far as we know, there was mm -hmm. no other ships that we could see. And um, how'd you spend, how'd you pass the time? Oh. Begin with, it was salt water for your bass, which is awful. You never feel right. And playing cards, poker, and every guy around you is smoker for me. <laughs> All right, you are non-smoking, non-drinking, you're across the Pacific. What was your rank? That's why I'm still living for mm -hmm. Boy. And you, uh, what was your rank at the time? Uh, when you hit Bora Bora. What was my weight? Your, your rank. Were you a private, private first class? Uh, just a soldier. Just a soldier. All the way through. Okay. And what unit were you with? The 692nd Amphibian Engineers. And what were your duties? We carried 
supplies up and down the coast of New Guinea. We even brought some, uh, what they call the people that taught the natives. Missionaries? Huh? Teachers, missionaries? The uh, girls. The girls, that, huh? That taught the uh, natives. Mm -hmm. uh, what are they called? Uh, were they in uniform or not? No, they no, they were just dressed like mm -hmm. casual. Uh, you mean teachers or what? Teachers? Not teachers, no. Hmm. Nurses? Church people. What are they? Missionaries. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Yeah. Couldn't think of the word. Missionaries. Mm -hmm. There was two of them, but the reason they asked if we would take them, our landing craft weren't down in the water. They could skim across the reef, and when we got there, we knew why. It was after Milne Bay, and it was. Not, not too far out. There's a missionary up on the hill, but the girl missionary, they were by themselves. And when we got there, it was reefs all the way in. But see a high tide, we could skim right across with the landing. It was 56 feet long it's to carry troops and tanks. But the, uh, we get into the beach and we had to stay till the next day I tried to get out. But we, they never see so many happy natives and all your life as they were to see these two women. They come back. They took them out away from the Japanese. What was the weather like? Hot. Hot. Well, my full dress was a pair of undershirts. <laughs> when I was on the boat, mm -hmm. and a life preserver. Still I good used to swim. say, I used to say that the guy, where the hell are you going to sw swim to? <laughs> when we be out in the ocean. Okay. And how long were you stationed in New Guinea? Sixty months. Sixty. Sixty. Oh, six months. Okay. Sixty. Uh -huh. Sixteen. Oh, sixteen. Months. That was a long time. Mm. MacArthur's, we went up to his headquarters a couple of times, and uh, can't think of the headquarters. Mm -hmm. We went to New Britain Island once to bring 400 Marines, dead Marines, off New Britain Island. They had a, a black outfit, digging them up and putting them in, in bags. And all we did was carry them out to the ship that was waiting there. And they'd take the bodies. They were bringing them back to Finch Haven, which was the main base. They had a, a great the air force was there. And it was a port 
support my brother-in-law, Terry, he came there. He was on a mine, oh yeah, and he came twice while we were there and finished it. Even he was a he was a chief storekeeper on the ship, <laughs> so he got us he gave us a side where he was right. Our main quarters was there in Finchhaven. It came right out to a point, and we were right out in a peninsula. So it was a beautiful. We had the theater in the base. We built, we had Jack Benny and another girl come to. I can't remember the year. It was a blonde. And it just, she was a movie actress. They came and gave us entertainment at our theater. Mm -hmm. We used to show movies. We had Jack Benny, and then we had, I don't think Bob Hope ever killed. But it was the main base of New Guinea. Hollandia was where Macaire, this he stayed. Mm -hmm. he, but MacArthur was a great man. Did you ever see him in person? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, in Manila. In Manila, well, we haven't got there yet. But we got artists to ship out, and we left. Oh, before we went, we had a company that was divers, and they went after they bought Manila. They went to Manila. They took all the divers down there. To get the ships out of the harbor. And so then we shipped out. We left, I think, the 15 guys behind to clean up the area. But anyways, when we got to Manila, they took us up to a, the Pasig River, which comes into Manila Harbor. And just, they dropped us off at this place looked like a field. It ended up it was rice paddies. Anyways, the natives told us not not to go there, but our officers were all from Tennessee. They all worked for the. At that time, the had to do with the Mississippi River. It was a government thing. They're getting the rest of the mm -hmm. river to flow better. But anyways, they, they decided they could, that's what they did. They were around the Mississippi. So they, they got us digging a trench to the river. So we got the other th thousand guys that had come. The whole company was about a thousand men. So we dig a trench. And it started ra oh. raining. And 
go through the river, went up, and that river came up right in the trench, right to where we were. There were snakes, there were the bugs, all climbing on our carts. So that thing didn't work. So we stayed there, I think it was one night. And we were further up the river. MacArthur's headquarters was right up the river. It was the president's palace. But we went beyond that to the town of Pasek. And that was had a hill. But it was just, we put our landing crew. There was we had six uh, fifty six foot landing crew. Put them on the side of the river. A good spot. And there was sugar cane plantation. So we had to walk through the sugar cane up to where the headquarters was up on a hill. hill. But our company was the, on the boats, not all of them. We had a headquarters company that some of them worked in. But we were on the boats all the time. So we had the landing craft right on the river. So we stayed there for 12 months, waiting to go, go to Japan, which never happened, thank you. Mm -hmm. So you were there in August of 45 when you hear something called an atomic bomb being dropped on Japan. Uh, what was, what was well, that like? What was the... Oh, the reaction. Oh, that was the greatest thing that ever happened, because it was over. Yeah. And do you remember the previous May when Germany capitulated? Yeah. Did you have any celebration about that? Oh, no? yeah. Mm -hmm. We had celebration, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> we were downtown Manila all the time take the boat to stay at the shipyards and dock it and go into Manila. So we went down time of art in Manila. Mm -hmm. Us women go over. All right, A-bomb drops, Japan after, surrenders. After coming 16 months in <laughs> New Guinea, it's like coming home. Yeah. Well, imagine. Yeah. Oh, by the way, when you were um, stationed in the Pacific, I know you had an encounter with your brother-in-law. Did you correspond regularly with the brothers that were my, stationed? I used to send my cigarettes to my brothers, Hank and Henry and mm -hmm. Bill. Now, Bill, see, so come over there. The B-29, when they took Guam, that's where the B-29s were. It was the closest spot to Japan. Mm -hmm. Now, the day that we were ahead of you to talk about Bill. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, were you, co you corresponded with your brothers regularly. Yeah. And I bet they were relieved when Japan surrendered. Oh, yeah. And well, oh, go ahead. Well, my brother Bill was on B-29s, and he's a flight officer. And the flight officer on B-29, he does about everything. Everything goes through him. If you, I should have brought the cartoon he made 
on the B-29. The pilots, are here, and he's over here like him. And he's got all the controls of the plane go through him. And so, but what I want to tell you, he crash landed a couple times. It wasn't from gunfire. It was, could have been his wheels didn't open or, or something, but twice they had a cra crash land. But he, now the, he made th about 30 missions over Japan on B-29. Now the day of the bombing, the first bomb, the, they did, well, when they put those bombs on the plane, no one know, knew who had the bomb. There'd only be one, one but there'd be Perhaps 50 planes, different types. And on the day of the big bomb, that they stopped the war, no one knew that, that either. But there were 200 planes went over Japan that day, all types, all the B-29s. They never told who had the bomb. So that no one worried about it. But anyways. Mm. But he made that many mi missions. And he came home. In fact, my brother, Hank, Bill, and myself all come home in January of uh, 46. I think Bill got home in December of 46. But we, we all come home about the same time. See, Donald and Dick were just in Arkansas. But anyways, what I wanted to tell you about Bill, when he came home, my brother and I used to go to the Dover Fireman's Ball every year before the war. And there was this night where where I was sitting on my mother's, she had one of these big famine porches in West Central. And we were, they were out on the porch with my sister, Janet, and Bill and Green was there, and Hank and I and, uh, with his wife, and I was with my aunt. I don't think I was, I was a marriage yet. So, we were going to the fireman's ball in Dover. And we trying to get him to come with his wife, but she just had an operation that week. So she could have children. So uh, she didn't feel that good. So they didn't come with us. Mm -hmm. They were going for a nice cream hunk home in Holliston. Uh, you know, you go through Sherman. Right. Uh -huh. 16, and it was on the left. There's an ice cream place. Anyways. 
they was, we went to the two firemen for, and my father and mother drove behind them with my sister, and they were going for ice cream cone. And on the way over, a thunderstorm came up, tree came down, right on the top of him and his wife, killed him. So that's... I'm sorry. That was a big thing when it happened. It's 150 some odd pieces at the f funeral. But to go through all that, what he did. Well, you're home. Huh? You're home back home in Natick, and you're. Yeah. Have you now set up your business with your brother? Yeah. Henry. Henry. We decided when we were writing to each other overseas. We decided we'd go in the forest business when we get home. My father had bought the, the piece of land. It was only 300 bucks. <laughs> that was back in low. He bought his house for 2200 there was six bedrooms on West Central. <laughs> <laughs> the things were different back then. Well, and, go ahead. Yeah. But, but we decided we went to the Natick Trust. I probably shouldn't tell that, but I will anyway. Uh, uh, old man Bishop, I call him old man, because his son was my Sunday school teacher in church, uh, and he went to that church, and we were asking for ten thousand dollars, which is not much money today, <laughs> but back then. <laughs> Well, so he starts telling us, well, we lost a lot of money during the Depression. And so who cared? You know, what's that got to do with 10000 So we figured it'd be a, a nothing to get 10000 Anyways, he refused to go. Uh, and so we went to our boss. I told you, Butterworth of Framingham. We're back to him now. We're going to be a competitor. So he says, he says, he picked up the phone, he says, I'm calling. He was the president, he wasn't then. He says, I'm calling down the bank. He says, they'll give you the money. He said, just get down there. So he, he gave us the money and we said, I wish I, brought the picture with me. It's the opening, the native bullet. 
It's on the front page mm -hmm. uh, a place. Not very big, you know, <laughs> how big, big it was, but it's yeah. a, a little place. Mm -hmm. Ken, did you imagine all the changes that were going to happen in Natick over the subsequent 20 years, yeah. the way the town just exploded? Yeah. No. It's, uh, well, look at what Matt and Sarah and Sumner Harris did, which were both, they were both in Kiwan Kiwanis with me. Mm -hmm. After I've been in 64. Six years this year, mm -hmm. and uh, we had a great club back the days. You can't get anyone to join now. Mm. Well, they're all tied up. My grandson, Warren Vicuna, you see his name. He's building them all over town. Mac Bab. Well, my son's dad and he gave it to him. Now he's selling real estate. <laughs> and he's all over town, mm -hmm. too. But he's, and now you know what he's got to do. Move to South Carolina with my three great grandchildren, <laughs> which, uh, He's the last two winners, he says, I can't put up with it anymore. <laughs> he says, it costs me money to build. He says, I can't make money that way. Let's get back to you for a moment, uh, right after the war. I know you, joined, you were, still are a member of the Kiwanis. Or did you join any service organizations? Oh, yeah. I was past command of the VFW. Uh -huh. I joined the Legion. I think I got through one office there, but I, I've tied up with the Vets VFW. Mm -hmm. I'm still a member of VFW and uh, joined the Mason. And when you left the service, uh, did you receive any uh, medals or commendations? Oh, yeah, you got a medal, medal for New Guinea and the Philippines. Okay. Yeah. And, and the rifle, good shot. I forget the name. Well, the marksman, uh, yeah. Marksman. And, uh, but, they didn't give me any. I should have had a sergeant for the running a boat, but there was another guy running it too. So they never gave it. Our was we had a first sergeant. Maybe another size. We know. Now, Ken, oh, I'm sorry. Huh? I was about to ask. Uh, oh, excuse me. Uh, did you um, use your, any of the benefits within the GI Bill? Did you take out oh, loans? Oh, yeah. Yeah? Hey, when, when we worked for that for. We were on the job training. Mm -hmm. We get a hundred a month. And they give him a hundred a month. So he had a good deal too. And he paid us a little extra. Mm -hmm. Now you mentioned, oh sorry. Back to that, I'll tell you. We used to give our wives when we started business, $10 a week out of that money. But that's all 
but they were working. They actually, my wife was working at, in Boston at Prudential. Then she went to Sun Life and Wellesley afterwards. But, uh, and my brother's wife was working when he got married at Denison. Everyone mm -hmm. worked at Denison. <laughs> I had a great uncle who worked there until they closed. Wow. In fact, he was a roach. He had a cap that said number one. <laughs> he worked. He died at 90, 91, I think. My great uncle. Wow. Yeah. He was my great uncle. My mother's sister's husband. Ken, uh, we're just about ready to wrap up this interview, uh, but before we do so, how important was it for you to serve in the military? Oh, very important. Back those days, when everyone was in the service, you, if someone asked me once, they asked me a hundred times, where are you going? So, you, you, there was no one. Because I was in high school where I started, 41. Ken, is there anything else you'd like to say before we wrap things up? No. Mm -hmm. well, Ken Barber, lifelong Natick resident, uh, World War II veteran, uh, starter of one of Natick's bigger and more beloved businesses. We thank you so much for coming in and recording your interview for the Natick Veterans Oral History Project. Thank you. Mm -hmm.